much pleasure to be back at this roundtable for the fourth time. And uh, let me give you uh, just a little bit of my book writing background. Actually, I wrote, it took me seven years to write the lead book while, while I was in the government and then retired in 03, and since then I've written, uh, written six more. And um, let me tell you just a sentence about each one so you uh, can understand my background in, in approaching the subject of the myth of the lost cause. I wrote a book on how Robert E. Lee lost the Civil War, uh, which focuses on uh, two major things. One is that we believe he's way too aggressive, way too offensive for a Confederate general given all the circumstances, and that he also cared more about Virginia than he cared about the Confederacy. I then wrote the, uh, the counter side of that and wrote about Grant being a victor, not a butcher, and explained my views on what Grant accomplished on the war, it was very active when I called three different theaters, Mississippi, the middle, and the east, won everywhere that he went, and he did so quite efficiently, and now is commonly regarded uh, by a majority of Civil War and military historians as the best general of the Civil War, uh, and one of the best in American history. I followed that up with a comparative book called uh, Grant Lee, Victorious American, The Vanquished Virginian, in which I really cover bulk of the Civil War by taking you through simultaneously through the campaigns of Grant and Lee. And of course, for the first two full years of the war, that they were not in the same theater, but they had an impact on each other. Uh, basically, Lee gave a lot of assists to Grant uh, because of Lee's non-interest in the West and the middle theaters. Um, I also do a lot of statistical analysis in that book, comparing the casualties. And I break it up into about six month chunks. So I'm telling you, here's what Lee was doing at the same time, here's what Grant was doing, and here's how they affected each other. Uh, actually, going back just a hair, the, the third book that I wrote was McClellan and Failure. That's easy to write about, right? <laughs> uh, but basically, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I claim the distinction of being the most anti McClellan author because I'm not only explaining his incompetence. Uh, and his unwillingness to fight his forces, but I focus uh, a lot of attention on his treasonous behavior in which he deliberately ensured that John Pope would lose the Battle of Second Manassas. Now, Pope was no shiny example of a great general himself, but he, he didn't need any help, perhaps, to lose, but McClellan made sure that he lost Second Manassas by engaging in what, what I can only describe as treasonous behavior over uh, a solid months period of time before that battle. Um, then I moved on to something different, which should be of interest to Illinoisans, and that is I did the only book writing study ever done of the Lincoln-Grant relationship. Well, Lincoln and Grant, the Westerners who won the Civil War, and so I give a thumbnail sketch of what they did and how they interacted during the war, and then I finish up with a 50-page standalone chapter on here is why the two of them got along so well and created Bill is a precedent for the very effective relationship of Franklin Roosevelt uh, and George Marshall in World War II. Um, my sixth book is The Myth of Lost Cause, which I'll discuss tonight. And my uh, seventh book will be out by January. It's called The Ten Biggest Civil War Blunders, uh, which was pretty easy. I mean, you can pick them uh, all over the place. Uh, and that's just a question of, of judgment about which ones are more significant than others, uh, which will be a subjective debate that will go on and on. In fact, I had so many uh, that I thought were significant that right now my work is on uh, a book tentatively called More Major Blunders of the Civil War. <laughs> Three, four, five. Um, I think I've got a couple other ideas on different books, but I'm, I, I'm pursuing that one. So that brings us to book number six, The Myth of the Lost Cause. Uh, I apologize to you because we sold out in Milwaukee last night with 103 people there. Actually, about 110 with the, the seated people added in. Uh, they, they bought all my books. So I've got a sign-up sheet on the end. If you give me $30 tonight, I will mail you the book signed and, and dated uh, on Monday. And there's no, no mailing charge involved. So have quite a few people signed up already. If you want to join the parade, that's fine. Uh, I've got a few copies left of some of my earlier books. If you don't see the one there you want, let me know. I can mail that to you as well. Okay, uh, on the myth, let me just tell you one other thing. Uh, I'm only going to talk about three hours tonight, 
Um, <laughs> and so if you want the longer version, um, actually, tonight's going to be about 45, 50 minutes plus Q&A. If you want an hour and 45 minute version, uh, a much more systematic and, and lecture type presentation, uh, I talked at the Smithsonian uh, last year, and fortunately C-SPAN was there to film it. So if you go to cspan.org and just punch in Bonnet Kemper in the search box right at the top, uh, you'll get that lecture and two earlier lectures that I did very early on Lee and on, and on Grant. So help yourself to that. Uh, let's see, I think those are all the advertisements, the paid, uh, the, the paid uh, sponsors uh, for this evening's presentation. Uh, so let's move on to the myth of the lost cause. I think it is um, my most important uh, book and, and my best book so far. And uh, one reason for the importance is that it relates very much to ongoing social issues. Uh, two years ago, it was the battle flag uh, of the Army of Northern Virginia. Now it's Confederate statues. And what does that tell us? It tells us that one reason we're so interested in the Civil War is because it's still relevant probably was the most important event in American history. Uh, and um, it dealt with a lot of issues which carry through to today. Now the big dispute, which I will address, is some people claim it's all about states' rights, other people claim, no, it's about slavery and white supremacy. And uh, I come down hard on the slavery and white supremacy argument, and I'll present you my evidence uh, for that. Before we go further, I need to uh, explain the origin of the lost cause doctrine, and then I'll tell you what's in the doctrine. Okay, the, the lost cause, which is so important because I think it was the most effective propaganda campaign in American history. Really, a PR firm could not have done a better job, uh, and because the interpretations coming out of it have affected our understanding of the Civil War for 160 years. Okay, so it was created starting in about 1860. Uh, actually, I probably ought, uh, I was gonna say 1870. I should say 1866, because actually, it was a book this thick, which a lot of you've seen the reprint of, by Pollard, uh, and uh, he was a Richmond reporter, and uh, his book was called The Lost Cause. So a good place to start. And so he was sort of the forerunner, but then by 1870, William Nelson Pendleton, a totally incompetent chief of artillery for Robert Lee's army, uh, Lee liked him, he was a friend and a minister, so Lee kept him around as a pet, I guess, because he certainly did not perform as a, as a competent general. Also, a moderately competent Jubal Early was involved. Uh, in fact, he did a better job promoting the myth than he did as a Civil War general. And then there was a J Reverend J. William Jones. There were some other players, but these guys are serious. For 30 years, they created organizations, they created a series of documents, uh, they created false evidence if they needed to do so, uh, uh, they, they told the big lie, uh, and really were quite successful in justifying the Civil War. So what you had was, the South had been devastated by the war. Cities in ruins, Countryside's in ruins. About one quarter of the white men of fighting age, between 20 and 45, in the South, were not just casualty, they were dead. They were dead and gone. So generations were wiped out. And we know, I think it's Michelle would argue, that the South did not recover economically, perhaps socially, for 100 years after the war. So looking back after about five years, uh, Confederate leaders had to justify to the people, why did we do, why did we start what we started What's the rationale? Now, defending slavery would not be a real great rationale for all the damage that had occurred. And so they came up with the concept of it was all about states' rights. It was all about states' rights. And so the, the doctrine that, that we know as the, as the lost cause, and it's often because of the myth of the lost cause, uh, that's sort of mixed origins because once you say the myth of the lost cause, the implication is it is a myth. It's not really true, and that's, and that's where I come from. And um, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to focus on the contemporaneous evidence to support my position. Now, you can agree or di disagree with my positions. I will state them pretty firmly, but I have an understanding there are different points of view, and that's fine 
all I really want to encourage is that you take a look at it yourself and you look at the relevant contemporaneous evidence and reach your own conclusions. Okay, so we have Gordon. And let me say that after 1900, this doctrine, which had pretty much taken over the South, became a national doctrine. From 1900 to 1920, the progressive era, everybody wanted to be American. Let's all join together and try to agree on things. And, and so it became an American doctrine. For example, there was a book written in the first decade of the 1900s, something like uh, Lee, uh, Robert E. Lee, Confederate Hero. About 10 years later, it was reprinted, same book, except for the title, which said Robert E. Lee, American Hero. And a lot of people are a little puzzled why Lee has become an American hero, and he certainly has, and it was really just a continuation of the myth of the lost cause, and then the icing on the cake, really, and it was more than a very thick layer of icing, uh, was put on it by uh, Douglas Southall Freeman in the 30s and 40s with his four-volume series on R.E. Lee, telling you how Lee walked on water, and then three volumes on Lee's lieutenants, which could have been called Lee's scapegoats. But it all <laughs> blended in with the myth of a lost cause. And so it was not until, I'd say, Alan Nevin, Bruce Patton, in about the 1950s, began to back off, take a fresh look at things, and then raise questions and concerns, and the debate, the debate goes on. Okay, so what's the substance of the myth of a lost cause? The substance, excuse me one second, Substance of the myth is this. Slavery was a wonderful institution, benefited everybody, uh, uh, especially the blacks, because it gave blacks an opportunity to perform at the highest levels they were capable of performing and provided them with shelter and protection and food, etc. So it was a great and beneficial institution. Now, quickly though, the myth has a little twist on it. It says, you know, slavery would have gone away on its without a civil war. So this is sort of a little dagger at the Yankees saying, yeah, we really didn't know we didn't need a war to end slavery. Because it was going to go away within a reasonable period of time on its own. Okay, that brings us then to the biggest issue of all. The $64,000 question is, why was there secession? Why was the Confederacy formed? And why did the South initiate a civil war? And the answer of the myth is quite clear. It's states' rights protecting the individual states against this big, bad, centralized federal government now led by Abraham Lincoln. And now we're going to take a long, hard look at that issue. Why? Because that issue is the most critical one, in my view, that carries through to the present day. Uh, when, when the historical argument becomes a current political argument, you have people on one side who say, it's all about states' rights and federalism. And then people on the other would say, no, it's all about race. And so we'll take a look at the original evidence on that subject. And you'll notice tonight, and call me on it if I, if I violate my own rule here, but I'm trying to look at evidence for the cause of secession and the Confederacy uh, in terms of 1860, 1861 evidence. With a little bit of reinforcement from how the Confederacy behaved during the war. And as far as post-war, forget it. What I'm telling you is I don't think we ought to give virtually any weight at all to arguments made from 18, from after April of 1865 all the way up to the present. Historians can argue back and forth, and I just say don't give weight to their arguments, look at their evidence. So let's focus on the relevant contemporaneous evidence on all these issues. Now, those are the most important aspects of, of the myth, but there are, there are other pieces which you have to understand, and we'll probably spend a little time on them. The book has, has more detail on it. Okay. The myth says that the South never had a chance to win the war. The Southern defeat was inevitable, and certainly a lot of people have bought into that over the years. And, um, um, and I'll, I'll give you my views on that. So, so Confederate victory was our Confederate defeat was inevitable, so says the myth. Now, as part of that, they say, but the South did the best it could with what it had, and Robert E. Lee was the leader most responsible for them 
getting the most out of what they had. And then Robert E. Lee, in fact, was one of the greatest generals who ever lived. And if you read a lot of the books that promote the myth, you will see Lee treated honestly as a Christ-like figure with references to his blessing of the children and his Gethsemane, etc., etc. Uh, Lee was truly made the mini-god out of the myth of the lost father. Two problems. One was Gettysburg, and the other was he surrendered to Grant. Okay. So, as arguments go, if, if you have some difficulty with particular issues, you attack personally somebody on the other side. And so, that's how Longstreet became the, the scapegoat Gettysburg. As early as Lee's birthday, uh, one year you had Earl give a speech, 1870 or 71, and the next year Pendleton gave the same speech, and they specifically went into how great Lee was and how Longstreet had lost the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, on the bigger issue of Lee versus Grant, there was a consistent drumbeat of attacks on Grant as a butcher, as a butcher. You begin to see the relevance of some of my earlier books and what led me to write this book. So, so Grant's clearly a butcher. He, he only won by brute force. In fact, that leads us on to the final little twist uh, on the myth as it applies to the Civil War, the succession in the Civil War, and that is that the North won only through the use of total warfare. And this is sort of a, I, I call it a last three decades, last four decades kind of thing, but it's a natural tag on and it's just using certain words <coughs> to in this idea about the North using brute force to win the war. But the allegation is, and, and it's commonly made, Ron White, in his biography of, um, of Grant, um, uh, has, has a description using that terminology. I think people are getting very loose on using the word total war. And the myth says that's how the North won the total war there. Now, I will be honest and tell you that there are many aspects of the myth that go on to cover reconstruction, okay? That's beyond the scope of what I'm talking about tonight, beyond the scope of my book, and quite frankly, beyond the scope of my knowledge. So I won't talk about it. Uh, um, but keep that in mind, if you want a comprehensive view of how American history has been treated, you have to understand that there is a follow-on to the myth that covers, uh, that presents a southern rationale for reconstruction, and there's another side to that. And that gets more very complicated because it's changed, it's different in every state, and it changed from 1865 all the way to God knows when. And you could arbitrarily talk about when Reconstruction ended. So, I think this is a set of very important issues, and let's now delve into them. I won't waste a lot of time on slavery. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a lot of support in the room for slavery. Uh, and uh, uh, the, problem, the problem is, though, that we have overlooked certain aspects of slavery, which have continued to affect American society. Um, from 18, I'm sorry, from um, 1790, 1860, 60 years before the Civil, 70 years before the Civil War, uh, there were about a million slaves who were sold from the northern part of the slave states, specifically from Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, northern North Carolina, Tennessee, where there was a great surplus of slaves for lots of reasons. About a million slaves in that 70 year period were sold into the deep south to get the cotton industry started and then to get it flourished as a major, major um, source of revenue um, uh, for the United States. Now, those million were not shipped off in nice little family groups. They were torn, in most cases, torn out one by one by one and sold because there were shopping lists that came up from the South saying we need childbearing women or we need fuel hands or we want some children who will develop into something else. And, and so there were very specific shopping lists people went for or the slave dealers themselves knew what was hot in the marketplace. And slave dealers roamed all the areas I mentioned to uh, basically pick off slaves one by one uh, with the master's uh, uh, agreement, and the master was paid. And so the sections of the north that I mentioned, the sections of the northern part of the south, if you will, that I mentioned, were 
basically making money on selling slaves as commodities. But the important long-range ramification is that whatever family unit existed, and, and it really wasn't, it was only an informal, an informal relationship, whatever family relationship existed was torn apart. No attention was made to family relationships, and this is part of the package deal, that slave marriages were not recognized, and that all the children were the property of the mother's master. So it was a property deal, and it had nothing to do with human relations, and so this went on, uh, really started in the late 1600s, went on to 1865, uh, in, which, in which black family relationships were not recognized, and black marriages were not recognized within the slave community, and the father was meaningless. So just think about that and say, what, what are the long-range implications of that, especially if you trail that through Reconstruction and other social developments in America? I think that is pretty significant. Now, I want to emphasize right here, because it ties into the next point about was slavery going away. Slavery was a huge asset in American society. Well, first of all, let me just quote you from the Richmond Examiner in the early 1850s, just to give you sort of a little, I think, a very typical flavor. Richmond Examiner said, it is all a hallucination to suppose, to suppose that we are ever going to get rid of slavery or that it will ever be desirable to do so. It is a thing we cannot do without that is righteous, profitable, and permanent, and that belongs to Southern society as inherently and principally and durably as the white race itself Southern men should act as if the canopy of heaven were inscribed with a covenant in letters of fire that the Negro is here and here forever, is our property and ours forever, and is never to be emancipated, is to be kept in hard work and in rigid subjection all his days. Now, why did they feel so strongly about that? Well, I have two twofold factors. One was one was economics, and another was social systems. And whenever I the word slavery in this talk. I'm, I'm putting in, please understand it as slavery slash white supremacy. Because slavery was a social system to keep blacks in their place uh, and to maintain the superiority uh, as a matter of uh, legal, social, and uh, economic status in the South. Now, as far as the financial, these numbers are absolutely amazing. In 1860, census determined that the totality of U.S. assets, with all the farms and all the equipment, transportation vehicles, houses, and slaves, all property in the U.S. totaled $16.2 billion. $16.2 billion. Now, a big chunk of that consisted of slaves. Uh, let me say, of the 16, of the 16 billion, uh, probably about 40% uh, were assets in the South. And I will tell you that the assets of the assets in the South, one half, one half of their money was invested in slaves. One half of their money. So you had a total of, you had 15 slave states, South and Mason Dixon line, you had 15 slave states, and they had a little over 3.9 million slaves, so about almost 4 million slaves. And they were worth, a total of $3 billion. So, at the time that secession started, the South had 19% of the national, national worth tied up in slaves. That's an opening for me to say, so who was going to pay $3 billion to slave owners to compensate them for these slaves? Because what was the motivation for them to end the slavery? Uh, there, there have been some arguments made about, well, somehow agriculture was on a down, on a down slope. But in fact, cotton was never better. Cotton consisted of about 75, at least 75 percent of the value of American exports was in cotton from the South, and roughly 75 percent 
of British imports from the United States consisted of cotton from the South. So long trend, slave prices were going up, cotton prices were going up, and so just in that field alone, there was great promise for the future. However, slave owners were not stupid, and despite what they said about slaves' abilities, they were also, by this time, leasing out their slaves. A lot of slaves were leased out. The Lee family did it, lots of, lots of others did it. Uh, very common practice throughout the South to make more money from your slave than having that slave work on your plantation, whatever your crop was, and lease that slave to businesses, to industries, to factories, so that virtually all the employees in the Richmond tobacco factory plant were, were slaves. Most of the employees in the Treasure Iron Works, ironically, were slaves. The southern uh, timber, uh, uh, iron, mining industries pre-war were largely manned by slaves leased out by their owners in order for their owners to make money. So we're not talking about whether agriculture goes up or down, and if the population keeps increasing, it's hard to imagine agriculture going down and slaves becoming less useful. But slaves are being used all over the South to keep the economy going and to keep the owners uh, making lots of money. Now, so I don't think they were voluntarily going to give up half of the assets of the South. So if they weren't going to give it up voluntarily, then who's going to pay them? Well, Lincoln tried this. You recall that the first year and a half of the war, Lincoln spent most of his efforts trying to make sure that the four border states, Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, and Delaware, stayed in the Union. He was very concerned about Kentucky, uh, and he did lots of things to uh, not attack the institution of slavery during that period of time. And as a matter of fact, he tried negotiating with border state leaders to say, will you buy into some kind of a compensated emancipation program? We even have this calculation showing that um, the expenses to carry on the war for 12 days would be enough to buy the freedom of all the slaves in Delaware. Was there interest? No, there was, there was not interest in doing that. Um, and that was the reaction of all the border state leaders that he consulted, and so he saw that as, as a non-starter. And, and so, uh, and, and to me, um, this is an indication that slavery was not just about money, uh, because some slave owners had to be astute enough to see that once, once there was secession, Confederacy and the Civil War, that there was some jeopardy to the institution of slavery. Nevertheless, to the bitter end, they refused to engage in compensated emancipation. Uh, and it seems to me because there were other things at work, and that is the white supremacy, the social institution, and uh, just keeping, keeping things the way they are now, in which a lot of people are making a lot of money, but we're also keeping four million blacks in their place, and ever since the Nat Turner Revolt in 1830, uh, on top of the 1790s revolt in Haiti, there was a fear throughout the South of slave revolts. And that's why you had very active militia throughout the South and nighttime patrols and caste systems, etc., because this benevolent institution had to be enforced in order to stay in place. Uh, and, and while I'm just generally summing up on slavery, or let me just add that I think we all know that it was kept in place by force, by murder if, if, if needed, certainly by torture and branding and whipping, uh, and that it was marked also by masters taking sexual advantage of slaves on their plantations, and obviously the best evidence of that is the number of mulattoes all over the South, many of whom had a... Um, Remarkable resemblance to their masters. Okay, uh, so I would I would tell you that I think the arguments about the benevolence of slavery and the arguments about slavery going away anytime soon are very questionable and are quite rebuttable by the contemporaneous evidence, particularly about the astounding value of slaves as a percentage 
of the national wealth and of southern wealth in particular. Now that moves us on to the big question of why did these southern states secede and why did they form a confederacy? And then why start a civil war? What were they really concerned about? Well, uh, here's, here's an example of some of a very famous historian who bought into the myth. John Keegan, a uh, famous British military history writer, wrote about 20 books, died a couple, couple years ago. In a book called Intelligence in War, he made an offhanded comment. He said, the southern people, however, were resolute in their determination to preserve states' rights, the legal issue over which they had declared separation. And I put this up as an example of a well-known, well-read um, person who had never really researched the issue but just bought into the common perception. And um, then, then you had others who sort of deliberately distorted the record. An example was Jefferson Davis in his two volume 1881 autobiography specifically states that there would have been a civil war even if not a single American owned, any, owned a slave. Uh, that was, you know, he was uh, at the sort of the height of really starting to form and solidify the myth of the lost cause and put it all on state's rights. Okay, um, so I'm going to disagree with that, surprise, surprise, and <laughs> I will give you my pieces of contemporaneous evidence for why I disagree with that. And just to make it clear, I'm saying that slavery was the cause of all the things we're talking about and that state's rights virtually nothing to do with it. Okay, my first evidence is demographics. In 1860, 61, 33 states, 15 were slave states, and isn't it something that only slave states seceded? I mean, over the course of 60 and 61, you ended up with 11 states, slave states seceding, and zero free states seceding. Okay, but it gets more interesting than that. If we break it down, the slave states broke into three groups. Seven of them seceded. Pretty much the deep south seceded before Lincoln even had a chance to become president. As a result of his election uh, in 1860, uh, and that election, of course, was all about the issue of extension of slavery into the territories or not. That's all that election was about. And once he was elected, that, that things uh, started in the direction of secession. Uh, and before, four months later, there was a four-month gap at that time. Four months later, he gets sworn as president. Uh, before that, seven states seceded, and they formed the Confederacy. So that's a fait accompli before he even comes in. So you need to look at those seven. Why did they leave so quickly? Then, then there were four more. So after, <coughs> after the Confederates bombarded Sumter and Civil War started, Lincoln called for troops from all remaining states down the rebellion, four more states, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, uh, left. So they're group two, the four states that left after the war started, because uh, not wanting to take up arms against their, against their sister southern states. And then you have the four border states I mentioned before. So we have three clear blocks among the slave states. In the first seven, there were 2.3 million slaves. Most importantly, slaves in those first seven states constituted 47% of the population. 47% of the population. And contrary to many numbers you may have heard thrown about, 37% of white families owned slaves in those states. The second group, the ones who went after Fort Sumter, 29% was the percentage of slaves and 25% of the white families owned slaves. In the four states that never left, their totals were 14% of the population uh, consisted of slaves and only 16% of the uh, white families owned slaves. So you can see that a couple points from all those demographics are that only slave states seceded, and if I'm going to use the, the phrase shorthanded, the blacker the state was, the more likely it was to leave the Union, and the blacker it was, the more likely it was to leave early. Now, some people aren't happy with statistics, but you can do a lot with them, so let's move on to other evidence, which 
And I think we'll move on to the very best evidence of why there was secession, why there was a confederacy. And that is what the seceders themselves said. What they said in their secession documents, uh, whether it was the resolution itself or an accompanying document that said, here's why we passed that resolution to get out of the Union. South Carolina, of course, went first, and the South Carolinians in their documents complained of northern states and federal failure to return fugitive slaves, which was required by the Constitution and later federal law. Um, quote, but an increased hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery has led to a disregard of their obligations and the laws of the general government have ceased to affect the objects of the Constitution. Uh, they complained that northern states had condemned slavery as sinful and that northerners had elected as president a man who had said government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. And they also complained that some northern states allowed free blacks to vote. So um, a lot of that does not sound, uh, uh, well, it's clearly, it's, it's clear that slavery is the heart of their complaint. But if you notice, uh, and I, I raise this from this one because it occurs elsewhere throughout other states' complaints, that they, they were complaining not only that northern states were not aggressively returning slaves, as they were legally required to do, but that the federal government was not doing enough. They were arguing the federal government is not doing enough to make sure that fugitive slaves are returned to their, to their masters. So that kind of undercut a state rights rationale. They wanted the feds to be much more effective. Now, Mississippi went second, and what happened there was the governor uh, uh, asked the legislature to convene a secession convention, and the secession convention convened, and unanimously voted for secession. So at several different le levels, we have some uh, interesting positions taken by uh, people in, Miss in Mississippi. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the secession convention said, our position is thoroughly justified is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important force of the commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate verging on the tropical regions, and by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. These products have become a subsidy for the world, and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. Then they had a long, long list of slavery-related grievances and said, quote, we must either submit to degradation and to the loss of property worth four billions of dollars, they added one billion to my number, uh, or we must secede from the union framed by our fathers to secure this as well as every other species of property. Florida went out right after that and clearly said, as a cause for secession, all hope of the preservation of the Federal Union upon terms consistent with the safety and honor of the slaveholding states has finally dissipated by the recent indications of the strength of the anti-slavery sentiment of the free states. Uh, I won't bore you with more, but this is these are representative of the views of those first seven states who succeeded. Six of those seven left clear statements why they did. Uh, and it's all about slavery. You can go through and you won't see states' rights mentioned. If I can quickly summarize what the states' right, rights argument I think legitimately could be is here's what they meant if and when they would ever get into states' rights, which was only years later, because they didn't mention states' rights at all in these documents. What they really were ultimately saying was we as a state have the right to maintain slavery. <coughs> We have the right to extend slavery into the territories, and both of these forever. And then if you don't let us do one and two, then we have the right to secede. So there was no real, there was no real general state rights philosophy. It was all a simplistic little formula saying we want slavery ourselves and we want the ability to put it into territories and keep it all forever. That's the, that those were the rights that they were insisting on, and those rights boiled down to Slavery. Okay, now, some overlooked evidence, although more and more people are becoming aware of it, is that of these first seven states, five of them appointed a total of 
about 51 delegates to other states. There's a book by a fellow named Charles Dew, D-E-W, uh, whose great-great-grandfather was involved in doing this stuff. Um, these delegates were appointed by the early seceding states to go recruit other states to secede and join the Confederacy. First thing is, they sent no one to any free state. They sent them to all the other slave states, uh, including a little bit to each other to reinforce, because one of the big concerns was, if you recall back in 1832, you had the nullification crisis in which John Calhoun and South Carolina got out in front of everybody, and Andy Jackson sent in the federal troops, sent them down by ship, and said, uh, I think you'll get with the program of collecting the tariffs that have been constitutionally, that have been legally passed by Congress, and if not, I'm prepared to enforce them. And so South Carolina had been caught out there by itself, backed off, and this was in the mind of people like Calhoun, who was still around, of course, uh, and and uh, uh, so these states, especially the early ones, uh, South Carolina and Mississippi in particular, Georgia, right behind them, they wanted to get allies. They wanted to get other states, so they had strength in having multiple states forming a confederacy. So they were getting, they wanted early recruits, and they wanted an early confederacy, and they, they did it by April, uh, well, actually by, by March, um, they had a confederacy, they had a confederacy in place. Uh, and so their, their, their lobbying um, was part of the effort to make sure they got other slave states to join in and have an operating new foreign government before Lincoln took office. So this whole book by Du uh, has the letters, speeches, and other documents created by these lobbyists, by these delegates, going to the other states. And, um, um, I could quote forever, but I won't. I will just say, the language I already gave you about the rationale in the secession documents themselves is the fundamental uh, body of work that they argued to the other states. Although, they were now in a less formal environment. They weren't creating these historic documents saying, we secede from the United States and here's why. They were just writing letters to governors and legislatures tended to get carried away. And some of these went on for 10 pages. And they let their hair down and, and let the cat out of the bag. I don't know if I've got any other analogies here or not. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically, uh, they got into the real social arguments beyond, uh, beyond these legal and economic arguments. And the bottom line that a lot of these folks argued was that, you know, if, if slavery comes to an end, and if blacks have legal freedom and political freedom, they're going to expect social freedom. And if we have social freedom, what's going to happen to our wives and children? And they painted that even in more detail, gruesome detail. So uh, they will get carried away. It was a, a very racist and emotional appeal to the other states to join the Confederacy. And, and so I, I think the Confederate lobbying efforts tell us again what it was all about. And I will just add to be clear about it. They said nothing about states' rights, nothing about states' rights, nothing about power. All, every sentence has the word slave or slavery or, or something akin to it in it. That, that's what it was all about, the whole lobbying effort to get others to join. Okay. Now, the Confederates, early 1861, uh, formed the government, and they developed a constitution. The Confederate Constitution gives us a little insight into what it was all about. The first thing they did, they took, this is very, very rational, very reasonable, they took the U.S. Constitution as a model and, uh, and said, uh, we use that as, as the framework, but then we're going to add what we really need to add, what this is all about. So they added a whole lot of pro-slavery provisions, basically saying that slavery is guaranteed forever, wherever it exists in any state which is a member and that they also asserted that there was an absolute right to establish slavery in any territory, and that that would also be permanent. And then free trade of slaves among all these states and territories was also written into the Confederate Constitution. Uh, 
Uh, I suppose because I'm a lawyer, I looked at one particular provision, uh, which at first seems like, well, that's not that relevant. But it's the supremacy clause. They have a supremacy clause in the Confederate Constitution <laughs> that was very similar to the U.S. Constitution Confederacy clause, although it was, it was rewritten a little bit to make it even more clear what they were saying. And the, the Confederate Supremacy Clause in the Confederate Constitution, developed in 18, early 1861, says that the supreme law within the Confederacy is one, the Confederate Constitution, two, Confederate law that is passed in Richmond. And then it goes on to say, and any judge in a state is bound by those two, notwithstanding contrary state laws. Does that sound like states' rights to you? It doesn't sound like states' rights to me. It sounds like these states were willing to switch masters, uh, thinking that they would have a more sympathetic master in Richmond, but basically, they legally said, Richmond calls the shots. Not Birmingham, and uh, not Jackson, Mississippi, etc., but Richmond calls the shots. That's what it says in the Confederate Constitution. Now, we also had some contemporaneous statements made by Confederate leaders. We had Jefferson Davis resigning from the U.S. Senate, giving a famous farewell speech in the, in the U.S. Senate, in which he said, you Northerners, especially you abolitionists, have brought in this national crisis by challenging our institutions, our peculiar institutions from the South, and therefore you threaten the Southern way of life, and therefore Mississippi leaving, and I'm leaving, it's been nice knowing you. So Davis is very clear why he and his state were getting out, and that was because of slavery. However, my favorite is Vice President Alexander Stevens, February 1861, delivered his famous cornerstone speech in Savannah, Georgia. And in that speech, and the reason for the name is that Stevens said, slavery is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Slavery is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Now, I had known that from my general reading. What I had not known is that he went on and explained things in a lot more incriminating detail. And what Stephen said was that Thomas Jefferson and the Founding Fathers made a bad mistake because they said that all men are created equal. But the Confederacy disagrees with that. The Confederacy stands for the proposition that all white men are created equal and that others are here to serve them. Okay, now about four years later, as the Confederacy was in its uh, final throes, uh, people began asking Stevens about this. Because Stevens was starting to talk about states' rights. See, by the end of the Civil War, the rationale starts being thrown in already. Oh, well, we were fighting, we're fighting for states' rights. And uh, uh, so Stevens was challenged, and his answer was that he had been misquoted. You know, fake news, misquoted. Uh, and and uh, the, the problem for Stevens was it was rather long misquote. And the second thing was he gave the same speech in Atlanta, and the Atlanta papers had the same. So there goes there goes that excuse. Um, okay, let's see before I get to one other piece of contemporaneous evidence. Let's see if I'm missing anything else that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, no, I think that's that's it. Now here's my final little series of, of evidence on what was this dispute all about? Okay, the southern states are seceding; they're forming a confederacy and national and state leaders who were pro-unionist uh, were very concerned about what can we do to keep all this from happening, and especially what can we do to keep this from boiling over and becoming a civil war. We don't want a bloody civil war, so let's try to work something out. So let's take a brief look at compromise efforts that were being made starting in December of 1860. Uh, and then going going through the next just the next few months, very contemporaneous, the very same time the states are leaving and they're forming a new nation. Um, because it seems to me, if you've got leaders who want to prevent a national crisis and a war, that they're going to address what they know or they perceive are the real issues that are involved, right? Okay, so. 
It starts out with President Buchanan in his final State of the Nation address in December of 1860, uh, in which President Buchanan, who I chose to say comes from my town of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, <laughs> said it cannot, it cannot be denied that for five and twenty years the agitation at the North against slavery has been uh, incessant. He said the long and continued intemperate interference of the Northern people with the question of slavery in the Southern states has at length produced its natural effects, and the different sections of the Union are now arrayed against each other, and the time has arrived so much dreaded by the father of his country hostile ge uh, when hostile geographical parties have been formed. And then Buchanan said, how easy would it be for the American people to settle the slavery question forever and to restore peace and harmony to this distracted country? And then he went on and, and he said, what we need is some constitutional amendments to protect slavery. That was his, his off-the-cuff solution, constitutional amendments to protect slavery, and then the issue, the issue would go away. Um, well, it was very short, but he put his finger on the pulse um, because that's the same direction that other compromise efforts took. Uh, so, for example, in, the month, in that month of December and on through January, two full months, there was a committee called the Committee of 31, which had a representative or a senator from 31 out of the 33 states that then existed. And so they spent two months working on this, trying to come up with a compromise. Their efforts were led by Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky, who was following in the footsteps of Henry Clay as, as a great compromiser, trying to bring people together. And so after two months of work, they came up with a, a series of <clears throat> recommendations for constitutional amendments. See, these guys were serious uh, because they, they, they thought we're going to have to do something that's going to be the highest possible legal level to assure the South that their interests will be protected. And so they did it in the form of constitu proposed constitutional amendments. The Crittenden Amendment, sometimes it's called Crittenden Amendment with a lot of parts, other times it's, it's called Crittenden Amendments because it does have a lot of parts, um, had the following proposals. Extend the Missouri Compromise Line, dividing slaves from free territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Recognize and protect slavery in existing slave states and all present and future territories. And then finally, a whole list of things that Congress would be prohibited from doing. Uh, Congress could not interfere with interstate <coughs> slave transportation <coughs> uh, uh, or transport of slaves to the territories um, that allow slavery. Could not abolish slavery in D.C. unless a whole bunch of conditions were met. Congress could not free slaves of federal officials bringing them into the district of Congress could not abolish slavery in places with exclusive federal jurisdiction, such as federal reservations within a state, uh, within a slave state. And, and my favorite is, at the very end of all these constitutional amendments, uh, the Crittenden Amendment said, uh, Congress may not pass any future constitutional amendments allowing any of the above or authorizing congressional interference with or abolishment of slavery. So basically what you have is a whole series of proposals. Every one is about slavery. And, uh, and the clincher then is, we're going to put all these in place and then not allow them ever to be changed. These are the unamendable amendments to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> really, you know, really send a message to the southern states that, hey, your interests are, we got you. We got you covered. Well, the biggest, wrong. Now, th these, I, I'm, I'm listing these just to simply show you that their focus was on slavery. That's the only issue they focused on. They knew that was the issue. Now, just the point of fact is these went nowhere, and they primarily went nowhere because a lot of them were inconsistent with the results of the 1860 presidential election. There were four candidates. They all had different positions on the only issue of that campaign, which was slavery. Should slavery be extended into territories or not? And the Republican Party actually had been formed in 1854 on that very issue after the Kansas Nebraska Act. The Republican Party stood for the proposition of no slavery in the, ter in the territories. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. They ran on that in 56. Lincoln ran on it in 60. And uh, Lincoln sent the word to the Republican leadership that they would have nothing to do with these 
disciples of Moses. He was consulted. He sent the word because, very simple answer, because it would be totally inconsistent with what the Republican Party stands for and why it was formed. So, um, but for our purposes, we know what these compromisers, would-be compromisers, at the federal level for 31 states thought the issue was, and the issue was slavery. The same thing happened one level down in the month of February 1861. The remaining states in the Union, most of them, met in Washington, D.C., in what's called the Washington Peace Conference for the whole month of February, and they came up with a list of constitutional amendments. And I won't bore you with the list, because the list is uh, basically a ditto sheet of the Crittenden Amendments. Uh, just minor modifications. Basically, the same thing everyone had to do with protecting slavery and protecting, protecting it forever, because again, it had, see how did they describe it? Uh, oh, uh, after listing all these um, uh, pro-slavery constitutional amendments, uh, the final one said, uh, it would require unanimous approval by all states to revoke any of these provisions. So again, you had the unamendable amendments to the Constitution to protect slavery. Uh, so, those are the best examples of the serious nationwide effort at the congressional level and, and then the latter state leadership level to get to the bottom of the issues, avoid a national crisis, and the only thing they talked about, the only thing they addressed, was slavery. Okay, let's move on quickly to, uh, oh, now I, I want to mention these are very short hands. Because in the book, I go into some detail on three arguments I made based on Civil War era evidence that the Confederacy itself was more interested in, in preserving slavery than they were, believe it or not, in winning the war or preserving their independence. They could not get over the issue of we're here, we're doing this to, to preserve slavery. Three examples of their wartime behavior by the Confederate government. First is dip diplomacy. They refuse to ever ensure or assure England and France, whose support they desperately needed at the governmental level, that within some reasonable period of time, they would end slavery. And this relates back to an earlier issue we discussed, but basically the point here is that in their diplomat, in their diplomacy, they refused to take that step, and I contend that they were in a position very similar to the American colonists in the Revolution desperately needed official foreign government support. Uh, and they did not go for it because it conflicted with their overriding uh, need and desire to protect slavery. The second thing is that they slit their own throat, veterans did, on prisoner of war exchange policy. You recall by the middle of the war, the North began significant numbers of black troops. Well, when they got into battle, if black troops were on the losing side and tried to surrender, a lot of them would be shot down. But a significant number also were captured. And so the issue is what to do with captured black Union soldiers. Well, the South basically treated them as property. They put them in jail. They sold them off into slavery. And they refused to trade them. They refused to exchange them. Now, why do I say this for the South? Well, because you recall that the South started the war with at least a three and a half to one disadvantage in white men of fighting age. So if you have a slave, if you have a POW exchange program, which was in place for the first couple years of the war, um, the South greatly benefits. The South greatly benefits because they had great deal of difficulty replacing any casualties that were killed or captured wounded, whatever, uh, and so any kind of, a, of an equitable slave, uh, a POW exchange arrangement benefits the Confederacy. And Davis and Lee refused to engage in exchanging blacks. Uh, and they, they insisted they were property and they were not soldiers, and so they were not subject to POW requirements or practice. So that was very harmful, and that lasted from late 18th in the early 1865, critical period of the war, and the South acted against its own interest in 
how it treated the black POW issue. And then finally, and this one you could, you could have three sessions of, of a round table on this, but um, my, uh, my assertion is that the Confederacy missed a grand opportunity by not using its slaves as soldiers, something they could have started early in the war, and I think uh, have made good use of slaves before it became more and more apparent that they were likely to be freed uh, by not joining the Confederate Army. But the South refused to use them, and um, and this is something I, I, I cover in detail in the book. And there, there are people who say, well, wait a minute, there were these large numbers of blacks who fought for the South. But most of them are apocryphal, or their memories 20 years after the war about uh, my slave, Jedediah, was really loyal and honest. Actually, I saw somebody shot down, and Jim and I picked up a gun and fired it. Uh, and then you have more extensive stories, such as a Virginia textbook in about 2010 asserted that 2,000 blacks served under Stonewall Jackson. This is an official <laughs> Virginia state-approved book. And so the Virginia Department of Education was asked about it, and the person who did it said, oh, I, I read that on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, and then, and then, I'll tell you another another big story about the alleged use of black is um, um, uh, in Louisiana. At the very beginning of the war, there were uh, they were labeled free black, but being in Louisiana, they were very very mixed blood. I mean, Creole and French and American and white and black, a very mixed blood. They were generally known as, as free blacks. Uh, uh, because the drop of blood and you were you were black. And about two thousand actually um, indicated an interest in working with their their social peers <coughs> in defending uh, Southern or Confederate interests at the beginning of the war. Uh, and so they are cited as an example. Uh, and the, the problem with that is number one, they were not part of the Confederate Army. Uh, they were never provided weapons. Uh, they had some of their own, of course, and they were actually technically, for a few months, part of the Louisiana militia. However, once the state legislature realized what was going on, the state legislature changed Louisiana law to make it illegal for anybody who was not white to be in the Louisiana militia. So much for those 2,000. And, and, and actually, the strongest evidence of, did the South use uh, slaves? Uh, is the legislative history of it in the Confederate Congress. But long story short, uh, there was extremely strong opposition to the whole concept throughout the entire Civil War. Uh, and the very end of 1864, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee finally saw that, you know, we really need to do this. Uh, and so they pushed for it, but they got blowback like you wouldn't believe from Southern politicians, the press, and the people. Uh, with arguments such as, but well, we went to war to protect slavery, what do you do? how can you do this? Also, uh, if we do this, we're admitting that blacks are capable of being soldiers, and if we do that, our whole argument underpinning our biblical arguments about helping the blacks and keeping, uh, 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 giving them a chance in life. So it just undercuts the rationale for slavery, undercuts the rationale for why we're fighting the war, and so there was real blowback. And as a result, nothing passed. The Confederate Congress never authorized the use of slaves um, until four weeks before Appomattox. Four weeks before Appomattox, they passed a watered-down law that said some could be used, but they needed their owner's permission, and they needed the permission of the state. And as a result, uh, the most you have is as many as 200 blacks who were just pulled out of hospitals. They were acting as corpsmen in hospitals, so these medical personnel were pulled out, and they were marched around the streets of Richmond uh, as though this was symbolic of, of, of a new trend, and uh, uh, trouble was, and they were asked to perform the manual of arms, but they were never given arms, supposedly. Uh, and so, uh, and so it, was, it was a joke, it was a fiasco, and so Confederate Congress never in any significant or timely way authorized the use of slaves, and that was potential manpower pool that might have been as large as, uh, as a million, which the South chose not to use to win the war and its independence, because it undercut, it would undercut slavery. Okay, so I hope I've given you enough evidence of the time of secession and formation of the Confederacy, as well as Confederate conduct during the war, which should tell you something about the focus, and I'm talking 
the sole focus on the issue of slavery. Very quickly, yeah, very quickly. Um, <laughs> did the South have a chance to win the war? Yes, a lot of experts felt at the beginning of the war. The South had a chance to win the war. They'd be smart. They'd do a Washington-type operation uh, uh, and avoid big battles. That was Washington did after a year or two of being, uh, uh, being hammered by the Brits. Uh, avoid big battles. Uh, avoid being overly aggressive. Uh, preserve your resources. Make them come at you uh, and, and basically uh, have put fairly non-aggressive defensive warfare. And because, why? Because, hey, the South is a huge area, but it's like two-thirds of Western Europe, which had declared its independence. And all the South needed was tied. All they needed was a stalemate. The United States, the Union, had to affirmatively defeat them, which is very difficult to do because of the large area involved, all the geographic hazards involved, uh, and the fact that the weaponry had changed so much that the advantage had gone over to the defenders. Um, okay, that's, I'll, I'll, that's, that's where I'll draw the line on that. Just simply say, don't assume that the South was automatically going to lose the war, because there are a lot of reasons why it should have won the war, particularly because a tie was good enough for a win. The status quo was good enough for them. Okay, that gets us to um, Robert E. Lee. We've got Lee, we've got Longstreet, we've got Grant. Okay, let me give you my favorite little summary. I've developed the numbers during, during my Grant Lee book. Um, keep this in mind. Ulysses Grant commanded five armies and three theaters. He was a winner in every theater, and he won the war. He did so at a cost of 154,000 casualties. That's killed, wounded, missing, and captured. 154,000, which I consider to be quite reasonable when you look at the number of battles and what he accomplished. And by the way, to put a note, he, uh, he imposed about 191,000 casualties on the enemy, so he was about a plus 37,000. On the other hand, Robert E. Lee commanded one army in one theater, which theater he lost, and did so at a cost of, hold on to your hats, 209,000 casualties. So Lee took, in, in a very similar uh, number of campaigns and battles, Lee took 55,000 more casualties than Grant. And why did that happen? Well, it happened because Lee was both tactically and, and strategically way, way too aggressive for a government, a nation state, that was outnumbered three and a half to one, and white men are fighting eight. Uh, and, and he acted as though he were a Union general with unlimited resources, and I'll be the first to say that had he taken the command that was offered to him at the beginning of the, of the war, probably the war would have been over, and, and had he done the same thing, and I know he did that, he would have been very aggressive as a Union general for the first year and a half of the war, the war would have been over by the middle of 62. And ironically, slavery would not have been tough. Uh, really ironic. Um, and McClellan was the one who sort of brought that about. McClellan, who really didn't want to touch slavery by his own cowardice and incompetence and treasonous behavior, uh, undercut the Union in the first year and a half of the war and made Lee appear to be a great general. Uh, and by doing that, he himself brought on the slavery issue. Five days after Antietam, you have the preliminary emancipation proclamation. Uh, okay, uh, but I want uh, uh, So we've got. Uh, Grant and Lee, uh, a brief synopsis. I'll just say this. Both, both generals were equally aggressive. But note that Lee's aggressiveness was inconsistent with what should have been the Confederate strategy. Grant's aggressiveness was consistent with a wise Union strategy of being as aggressive as you can be because you've got the affirmative burden of defeating the enemy, not just settling for some kind of a stalemate. Okay. One minute on Longstreet. Um, the big story on Longstreet was that Pendleton and, and Early and then others said, you know, after day one at Gettysburg, Lee ordered Longstreet to attack the Confederates at dawn, at dawn on day two of Gettysburg. And he didn't do it. He didn't attack until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So there you have this, uh, this long, long gap of seven, about 10 or 11 hours that Longstreet didn't follow Lee's orders, and the result was the Confederates did not 
break the Union line on day two. Well, the problem with that is that uh, as of as of dawn, Lee had not given any orders to Longstreet. In fact, at dawn, Lee sent out a scouting party to try to determine where the Union forces were. Simply, were they on Little Round Top or not? And so it was hours later before he gets his scouting reports back. He's not in a position to give anybody any kind of order until that happens. But also, keep, keep in mind that Longstreet had two divisions that as of dawn were not on the battlefield yet. They were still coming down the very crowded chambers where Piper sat down roads. And, and so the last of Longstreet's troops arrived at about noon. And uh, so just as we know, Longstreet actually was given an attack orders by Lee around 10 or 11 o'clock time frame, and Lee agreed to an extension to noon because troops were still coming up. And so now we have it down to about four hours, and we have a couple miles that Longstreet has to <coughs> march all his troops, and his troops are guided by Lee's staffer, Captain Johnston, Johnson, who had been one of who had been the lead scout in the early morning scouting expedition and marched Longstreet's troops right into the along the road where they could be seen from Little Round Top and had to do a reversal around another road to get to their final jumping off point. So in, in all honesty, I, I think the most you can say about Longstreet is maybe he should have attacked about two hours earlier than he did. Uh, meanwhile, here's my evaluation of, of Lee at Gettysburg. Day one at Gettysburg, Lee arrives after his forces have been very successful. Uh, despite the fact that Lee's been giving orders all day not to enter into a general engagement, uh, meanwhile, his forces are waking out uh, two Union corps and driving them back the 1st and the 11th, by driving them back to Gettysburg towards the higher ground. So Lee comes up, he gets his first chance to get involved, and what does he do? He issues the worst order of the Civil War, in which he tells General Ewell to take the high ground if practicable. If practicable? Uh, I mean, you either do it or you don't do it. And then Lee's rationale after the war was, my whole army was up. Well, he had, in fairness, at least half of the seven, uh, of the, he had nine divisions. He had at least half of them up or just about there. Uh, he had about half of his troops that could have thrown in at that point he probably had a 35,000 to 21,000 man advantage. And he was not given a whole lot of orders. And what did he think the other side was going to do? Just status quo? The Union had two corps up. They were both battered. The third corps is arriving. And there are four more corps going to be coming up pretty soon. So uh, the rationale doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and so he blew a chance for Confederate victory. There's no guarantee that the Confederates would have taken the high ground. But I think it is very rational to say that that was the best chance Lee had in the entire three days to take the high ground because when he ordered continuing assaults over the next two days and nights, uh, the odds were longer against him than they were at the time that he passed up the opportunity. Which gets us into days two and three. In days two and three, here's a, a real quick snapshot uh, of what I see happening. The end of day two, he had long street attack on the south, while roughly most of the other two-thirds of the army was watching. Uh, after that, Peter's out about an hour after that's all done. Finally, 24 hours late, you will attack from the north end, and your battles up there are going well well through the night. Uh, but Yule's attacking without support from the other two-thirds of the army. And then finally, on day three, you have Pickett going up the middle with little, if any, support from the other two-thirds of the army who are watching. So it was like Antietam in reverse, where McClellan had piecemeal attacks. Lee had a series of piecemeal attacks at Gettysburg, which were most ineffective. And you could, I could also throw in that the best chance for success probably turned out to be uh, Longstreet's attack uh, extending up into Hill's Corps uh, on day two, when Lee was there with Hill and did not personally ensure that Hill's men on site were all sent in to support Barksdale charge, there's a whole book on that, but that being the best opportunity for Confederate success, and Lee screwed it up. Lee liked to, and sort of admitted this, he liked to contemplate orders and then issue orders sometime overnight and then just stand by and let God's will take place instead of being a hands on commander during most battles. Um, so that's, that's Lee at Gettysburg, and I won't give you any details because most of you know all about it. Uh, the, the fantastic campaign uh, by Grant, which ended up 
in capture Vicksburg and a 30,000 man army. Uh, one of the greatest campaigns in military history, still studied worldwide because it has all the earmarks of a great military campaign. And my final note will be that um, uh, my contention is the Union did not win by total war, they won by hard war. Hard war. Total <coughs> war, to me, total means total. It means no hope for it. So you take the Japanese, you take the Germans, you take the Russians, and many, many examples throughout history where an army goes in, systematically uh, conducts mass rapes and mass murders of civilians. That, to me, is total war. Fortunately, we did not have total war in the American Civil War. Closest to it were, like, many <coughs> civil wars, very, very nasty, dirty uh, warfare at the guerrilla local level up and down the Appalachians and in Mississippi and in Texas. Uh, but you had no systematic, large-scale uh, war that could be described as total war. You had really, really bad and harmful economic warfare against the southern people to demonstrate northern strength and to demonstrate the Confederate people, the Confederate government could not protect its own people. So, I've scratched the surface uh, and I urge you to research these issues on your own, but particularly pay attention to contemporaneous evidence and not just arguments made, such as I made tonight, not just the arguments made by historians later, go through the arguments and look at what's the evidence. Look at contemporaneous evidence on anything you study about the Civil War. And thank you very much for your attention. And I think we probably, we probably have time for a few questions. Oh yeah, Long, Long Street was an ideal scapegoat. Uh, he favored protection of black rights in the South. He went into the South. Uh, he became a member of the Grant administration. He, uh, I think, was appointed by Grant as the collector of uh, uh, tariffs in the port uh, of New Orleans. And and the worst thing was in the South, he was a Republican now. He was a Republican. And Grant also, uh, I'm not Grant, but, but uh, Long Street also made some comments somewhat critical of some aspects of how Lee had conducted the war. So uh, they came down hard on him. They needed a scapegoat, and boy, he was ideal. And then he played into their hands because what he wrote, like most of the memoirs out of the Civil War, uh, uh, had some falsehoods in it. Uh, he, he defended himself on some uh, inaccurate grounds. So he got hammered. There's no monuments to Long Street in the South either. Um, not many, yeah. Nobody in this room or any other room I know of that was slave. However, as the 1850s progressed, I'm looking at your political slash economic slash social aspects of the institution. Didn't the South have an appropriate, objectively speaking, have an expectation that escaped slaves would be uh, returned, uh, that the Constitution would be enforced, and that's on the political economic part. And on the social part, since we had states like Illinois, Wasn't the South objectively concerned about what would happen if uh, the slaves were uh, were were free? Oh, okay. Uh, I will. I will say that. I mean, we could argue forever about were they right or were they wrong. That's not what here. What I'm on here to argue is, is they uh, they basically made an issue out of all these things. It was those slavery issues that caused them to secede. Uh, and, and I specifically avoided saying whether there was merit or no merit to the argument. But, I mean, you're right. For example, yes, the Constitution said fugitive slaves have to come back, and, and federal laws in the 1790s, and again, the Compromise of 1850, reinforced that. And so, as a matter of law, fugitive slaves should have been, should have been returned. Look, lots of debates, though, about what kind of due process was owed to the slave, uh, uh, who was identified as allegedly being this runaway back in Virginia by slave catchers, and you had a federal law that paid the federal magistrate double the fee if he allowed the slaves to be taken back than if he allowed them to go free in the northern state. So there's lots of issues of fairness, but for purposes of this lecture, it's, it's, and, and this issue in general, the 
question is not whether something was legal or fair, it's what was the focus on, what were the arguments about, and all they cared about was, was the fugitive slaves. And, and by the way, the fugitive slaves numbered, for, for the decade before the Civil War, minuscule numbers, uh, you're probably talking 2,000. So they made a big deal out of it, but every single state that gave its reasons let off with that because they had a lot of legal basis. Because, hey, right there, the Constitution says this, and you're not doing it. Uh, but interestingly, they not only went after the other states for not doing it, they went after the big bad feds for not giving them enough support, which was kind of ironic because both Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan, Democratic presidents who were in office because of Southern support, really, really pushed the turn of fugitive slaves as much as they politically could. Yes, sir. Apart from a few radical abolitionists, the white supremacy racial <coughs> argument was equally existent in the northern mm -hmm. white population at that time. Oh, yes. Have you given any thought to that sort of social racist attitude contributing to the acceptance of the myth over time? No. Oh, uh, I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, and and um, as I've said in a Letter to the editor in our recent uh, in, in our paper in Lancaster County last week. We had a guy who wrote in and said the Civil War is all about cowards. So obviously, I had to get on my computer. I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I ended up saying that that we really have to get to the bottom of the causation of the Civil War, the existence of the Confederacy, uh, and the symbolism of the flag and the statues, uh, because a lot of it relates to the fact that America has not dealt with uh, its Kill its heel, which is racism. And so, uh, I mean, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Amish country, good Christian area, plain to plain sex, etc. In fact, if you ask them to self define Lancaster County, say, we're Christian. Well, until until just a, a couple of decades ago, uh, there was segregation in the theaters, segregation in the restaurants, segregation in the amusement parks. Uh, this is all over the north. Uh, when I practiced law in the 60s, I, I quickly encountered the fact that. All over the country, virtually every deed in this country prohibited anybody who owned property from selling residential property from selling to a black, a Jew, a Catholic, etc. So we, we've had some deep-seated, uh, especially racial problems in this country, both north and south. And you can't just point the finger one way. At <clears throat> Northern uh, New York bankers had mortgages on a tremendous number of those slaves who were sold into the south. Those plantation owners couldn't pay cash, so they mortgaged individual slaves. The documents are in New Orleans, uh, and so mortgages on slaves were held by bankers in New York City and in London and Paris. It was a worldwide thing, and this may be one reason why there was real talk about New York City seceding when the southern states seceded, because they had <laughs> such a financial stake in the whole thing. And of course, uh, uh, New Englanders uh, ran the slave trade. So Racism was a national problem. It was not just a not just a southern issue. Yes, sir. I always thought that the myth of the lost cause was not only racist but also very xenophobic because the argument was Lee was better than Grant and our Confederate soldiers were better than the northern soldiers, but they just had the numbers. It was the numbers that beat us, and the reason they had the numbers is because all these lousy immigrants were pouring into the north and being given rifles to kill our good rest. Yeah, there was a lot of bad mouthing of immigrants when. Middle of the war, Patrick Claiborne uh, opposed the use of black slaves as soldiers and, and therefore killed any chance he ever had a promotion or getting three stars or a corps, etc. When he did that, he he had a long, thought out white paper. And, and he basically said things like if, if half trained, uh, if half trained blacks and, and he had some negative term about foreigners can, can fight and certainly our. Our slaves can do better than that. Uh, so yes, it, it was it was xenophobic as as well as as well as racist. Yes, sir. In the back. Yes, kind of uh, following up on uh, this gentleman's question here, the white shirt. About um, uh, I'm curious on what your view is as why the North went to war with the South. I mean, that seems like a super. Oh, okay. You know, the question yeah, totally because, because, yeah. because you know, I mean, I, for example, I had five ancestors who fought in the Civil War. For North, and I bet if you would have asked all of them, they said they were fighting to preserve the Union. That's right. I bet you probably not a one of them would have said that they were fighting to be free slaves. You know, your whole idea about New York and New England <coughs> textile mills 
Mm-hmm. So, right. you know, I'm guessing that they would say, well, we were attacked at Fort Sumter and we got to protect, you know, we were attacked. So I'm curious what, 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 your, what, what your view is as on why, because I think they were just as, I think, yeah. even, I think your average northerner was probably as racist, and I think that some of that balance needs to be brought into this argument, because so much of this is like targeted at the South in this racist society. The myth of the lost cause, myth of the lost cause, only addresses the issue of why was there secession and why was there a formation of the Confederacy and why did they start the Civil War? Okay, so that's a question about why did the Southern leaders do what they did? That's what I've been discussing tonight. It's a, there's a very, there's a series of separate questions. Another is, why did individual Confederate soldiers fight for the Confederacy? That's beyond the scope of what I'm talking about, and the myth doesn't really deal with that much at all. And But you raise the flip side, which is, why did the North then go to war, and you put your finger on it exactly. It was all about preserving the Union. That's what Lincoln relied upon, what was called arms, relied upon patriotism, and boy, that worked like a charm, pro-Union. Uh, and um, I think Gall- Gallagher was the one who did a massive study of Union soldiers' letters, uh, pretty much confirming that the bulk of them were fighting for the Union, not not fighting not fighting for uh, for slavery. So you have the question: the Union, budget. why did the Union government go to war? That's pretty obvious because the war had been imposed on them, and then they uh, and they did so. And, and Lincoln was concerned. Lincoln was primarily concerned uh, for the first year and a half of the war about preserving the Union. That was his number one goal. And then he slipped into the slavery issue, and, and we can always think of what were his views during his lifetime and all, but by July of 1861, just a year and a quarter, by 1862, a year and a quarter into the war, he's already got a draft emancipation proclamation. But remember, it was more focused on um, uh, military matters. It was military necessity. Under the laws of war, military necessity, you can seize the assets of your opponents. And so that was the rationale, and he worked closely with uh, Lieber, uh, legal advisor, and and uh, uh, and came up with the rationale for doing it. But it, it, that moved in the direction of the emancipation, uh, and he felt that was the most he could do under the Constitution um, uh, was to go after enemy assets. And there already were on both sides all these confiscation laws that that pe- that both legislators. Both Congresses had passed in Richmond and D.C., and so he was merely an extension of wartime confiscation. So, uh, when questions are asked about what were the <coughs> motivations, what were the motivations on both sides, you have to ask at least four questions. That is, on each side, why did the leadership do what it did, and then secondly, why did the soldiers do what they did, and also recognize there's no uniform answer to the soldier question because. That changes with time and place, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, sir. So they were, well, blacks were considered property, so it fit right into the Confiscation Act. Uh, oh, absolutely. By making them contraband of war. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly the, the rationale uh, that was used to, to create the word contraband. Uh, when uh, slaves first approached uh, uh, Fort, Fortress Monroe, very early in the war, and sought protection, and it was given to them. Uh, yes, sir. Father. Something like that. He freed all of them. The problem Washington had was 
about half the slaves he and Martha had were Martha's. She and hers, and he couldn't free them. He just couldn't do anything. But he freed, he freed his own slaves. And this sort of passed down to his adopted son, who, um, who had sort of dissipated the estate, and Lee had no problems because the will was confusing, and, and Lee was trying to honor all the bequests in the will by continuing to work the slaves for the five years to get money out of them. Then the Civil War comes along. It's just a real mess. Uh, but uh, Lee got into historical trouble because he had some runaway slaves. And the best evidence is that he treated them very cruelly when they came back, basically having at least one man, maybe two, including one woman, whipped badly to punish them for running away. He was trying to reestablish discipline father-in-law had lost at the plantation. His father was more of an artist type, and he didn't, he didn't run the plantation very efficiently, and the slaves had gotten used to very good lifestyle at that particular place. But that whole thing is a big exception. There was not a lot of manumission or, or emancipation going on uh, in Virginia or anywhere else in the South. Last question. Well, yeah, one, first off, thank you very much for a very comfortable presentation. It reminds me of when I That said, I've never bought into this concept that the South was really adopting the black slave to fight for them. Do you really think that would have happened? I, I think yeah, at the beginning of the war, a, a substantial number, yes. Uh, because, freedom, because it wasn't it wasn't quite it, because as the Stillman pointed out, the, at that point everybody was talking union. We're gonna have one country or two countries, and it was all about union. It only starts to get dangerous for southern slave owners when the emancipation proclamation, the preliminary emancipation proclamation is issued, September 22, 1852. Then it becomes very dangerous. Then everybody can sort of see where this thing could be. But a going. subjugated people would have taken up arms. Uh, well, historically, historically, historically it's happened a lot of times. Um, uh, now, because slavery it wasn't all that widely practiced. By the late 1860s, but basically, you had historical precedent of Romans and Greeks and many others using captured people who were slaves in warfare. And the deal always was if you do that, you win the war, you and your family are free. And basically, at the very end of the Civil War, that's exactly what Davis and Lee were pushing for, and Congress wouldn't buy into it. They didn't promise slaves. Uh, uh, themselves freedom if they fought, let alone their families. And so there was no way that's going to fly. And that was just a reflection of the real hardcore, widespread resistance to anything that was anti slavery. The British Thank offered it in the Revolutionary War. Oh, well, that's great. The British, yeah. the British offered it, and they got about 20,000 takers of American slaves who fled, fled to British lines. Uh, during, the, uh, during the American Revolution. About 10,000 died on ships that were disease-ridden uh, along the coast, but the Brits honored their promise. They violated the treaty, the 1783 Treaty of Paris, 1783, 